Good morning. <clears throat> For those of you that were wondering, Herbert has left the building. <laughs> Was it easier? No. <laughs> no, it wasn't. We asked all the strong young men to come and help, and they watched. <laughs> all us older guys moved Herbert. <laughs> um, today we are wrapping up this series on our identity. Now, by no means was this series all-inclusive. Uh, there are a number of things that people have spoken to me about that uh, could have been included. That's true. I encourage you to continue to look through the scriptures and see who God says you are. Okay? Um, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open to 1 Peter chapter 2. <clears throat> I'm going to start in verse 7. What we see uh, as Peter is writing, right now he's, he's uh, doing a contrast between believers and unbelievers. Okay? And in verse, actually I'm going to back up to verse 6. He says, For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone, chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word, as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. I want to focus today on verse 9. Okay? Now, Peter was an intimate of Jesus Christ. Okay? He walked with him, he ate with him, he slept, he, he was chastised several times. I love Peter. Because Peter shows me somebody that in their zeal takes wrong steps. And how faithful God is to bring him right back on track and, and use him and move him as God desires. Okay, so when you feel like you know, you're kind of stumbling and bumbling about in your faith. Look at Peter and take hope. Okay? Because if Peter could, could stumble and bumble about and yet be used, as God, used of God as one of the early church fathers, then there is hope. Okay? So, Peter's talking here and he says a number of things. Uh, I grew up singing this song out of the King James. And the King James... It, it, it kind of misleads us a little bit in the way that it phrases some of these things here. But it's not so much because they incorrectly interpreted the word as it is the language change. Okay? The 1600s, uh, does anybody here have a King James Bible? Is it the New King James or the, the original? Or one of the original? I'm sorry? Okay. Does anybody know the song, You're a Chosen Generation? Good, I'm so glad. <laughs> I asked Christy last night, I said, do you remember this song? And I started singing it to her. And she didn't say yes or no, she just sang along with me. <laughs> you, you could have just answered. Okay, you're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. And what do we think of as peculiar? Strange, weird, Strange, weird off, different. And, and while that word does apply because in the eyes of the world we are very different. We, we should be different. We, we no longer resemble them. 
we should reflect and resemble Christ. So in that manner, peculiar fits, but peculiar when, when the King James was written did not mean weird, different, off. It, it meant somewhat something or someone belonging to someone else. Okay, so in the, the newer translations, uh, the ESV, it says, uh, a people for his own possession. And that carries the right idea of what Peter is saying. Now, we look at these, it says, you are a chosen race. <coughs> you are a chosen race. Now, Everything in the Old Testament has a completion or a fulfillment in the New Testament. Okay? And some of it is, is a completion that the New Testament is pointing us to, as in the second coming of our Lord. Okay. <clears throat> but in the Old Testament, we see this same phrase being used of a particular people. Okay? God spoke down from heaven, and he spoke to Abram. Now, if you remember, uh, Abram was living in Haran with his father and with his nephew and his wife, Sarai. And God spoke to him and said, go to a place I will show you. Now, it, it's interesting to me because when Abram's father left the area of Ur of the Chaldees, he was en route to Canaan. But he stopped in Haran. And he stayed there. So God spoke to Abram and he said, go to a place I will show you. So Abram packed up and went. He took his wife. He took his nephew. He took his possessions. Said, see you later, Pop. And off he went. Okay. Now God chose Abram. And he told Abram, from you I will make a mighty nation. Right? You ever stop to wonder why God chose Israel? You ever wonder about that? Why would God choose this particular people? A people that by his very own description says, he says they're, they're a stiff-necked people. They're stubborn. They're hard-headed. Why would God choose them? Well, you don't have to wonder because he tells us. Okay? Um, <clears throat> flip with me to Deuteronomy. We're going to go to Deuteronomy chapter 7. Does anybody know what's going on here in Deuteronomy chapter 7? Is anybody familiar with, with this passage? Moses is speaking. He's kind of giving his farewell address. He's kind of summing up where they've come from, where they are, and where they're going. Okay? And in verse 7, or chapter 7, verse 1, he says, When the Lord your God brings you into the land, that you are entering to take possession of it, and clears away many nations before you, the Hittites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, seven nations more numerous and mightier than you. And when the Lord your God gives them over to you and you defeat them, then you must devote them to complete destruction. You shall make no covenant with them and show them no mercy. You shall not intermarry with them, giving your sons and your daughters to their sons or taking their daughters for your sons for they would turn away your sons from following me to serve other gods then the anger of the Lord would be kindled against you and he would destroy you quickly but thus shall you deal with them you shall break down their altars and dash in pieces their pillars and chop down their ashram and burn their carbon images with fire now verse 6 okay now, now first before we move on this sounds kind of hard doesn't it I mean, God's, God's telling them to come in and wipe out these seven people. 
As a matter of fact, he's not even saying go in and wipe them out. He's saying you go in, I'll wipe them out. Okay? Now, we look at that and we think genocide. Now, now does God's purposes equal our purposes? No. Oftentimes, we fulfillment of our purposes in his, but God has a plan much bigger than ours. Now, these seven tribes were not just handed over to destruction blindly. Okay? You read back in Genesis. These seven nations had the word of God. God had, had been <coughs> delivered unto them as the one and only God, the only true God. And they rejected him. Okay? And they turned away to following false gods. Okay? It's not like they didn't have their chance. They had their chance, and they turned away. So God is bringing Israel in, but pay attention to what he says in verse 6. For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession. Out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. It was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you. For you are the fewest of all peoples. But it is because the Lord loves you and is keeping the oath that he swore to your fathers that the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the hand of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. Know therefore that the Lord your God is God, the faithful God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keeps his commandments to a thousand generations and repays to their face those who hate him by destroying them. He will not be slack with one who hates him. He will repay him to his face. You shall therefore be careful to do the commandments and the statutes and the rules that I command you today. Why did God choose them? Because he loved them. They weren't numerous. There, there, there was nothing about them that set them apart and made them unique. As a matter of fact, even up to this point, I mean, taking them out of Egypt, all the miracles that he did, he brings them to the mountain of the Lord, and while he is giving his word to Moses to deliver to them, what do they do? They make a golden calf and start worshiping it. Oh, look at this shiny golden thing that delivered us out of what happened. Who delivered you out of Egypt? Are you so quick to forget? Yes, we are. But God chose Israel to fulfill his purposes for and through. Now, when he chose Israel, he said that through them he was going to bless all nations. We see the fulfillment of this in the birth, life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Jesus was born a Jew. Okay? He most likely did not have blonde hair and blue eyes. <gasps> Heresy. He was Semitic. He was a Jew. He celebrated the Jewish Passover, the Jewish feasts. He obeyed every letter of the command that the word was given of the Lord. In all of his ways, he was perfect. He celebrated Hanukkah. Through him, all nations were blessed. Now, flip back over to 1 Peter chapter 2. <clears throat> You are a chosen race. Just as God chose Israel, God has chosen you. Now, uh, I know a lot of people get off on uh, predestination at this point. Listen, God chose the nation of Israel, but in return, the nation of Israel, as individuals, individually they had to choose God. Okay. Otherwise, there would be no if or. 
Because when he laid out his commandments, he said, if you follow my commandments, I will bless you. Or don't follow my commandments and I will curse you. He chose them as his people. They were his. But they in turn had to choose him. Okay? They had to, of their own volition, accept what he said and embrace it. Okay? So when God has chosen for himself a people, he takes them from every nation, every tribe, every tongue, and he makes them his own. Now the word says that God desires all men would be saved. Right? Amen. It is God's desire. His heart is that no one would turn away, that no one would fall. And he has made a way such that no one need fall. And yet, just like many of the Israelites who had the word that was given to them, a lot of people are rejecting the word that was given. Okay? But out of those, out of all of these different countries, all of these different ethnicities, and, and think about it, I mean, there's a lot of different ethnic people out there. You find one country, and within that country, you're going to find separations of peoples. But out of all of those, I mean, think about it just here. I know uh, we're, we're moving up to graduation. So, do the Stevensville graduates think the Darby graduates are the same as them? Oh, oh no. <laughs> oh, no. No, no. Does Victor look with equal eyes at Corvallis? <laughs> and you can see the separation just here in this valley and yet out of all of this wide disparity of people God is drawing to himself a race that will be his very own and you are a part of that race you are you are one that has heard the call the word has gone forth to your hearing. It has birthed in you a desire and a hunger to know God. And he has made of you a chosen race. Now, but the next phrase, look at this. You are a royal priesthood. Hebrews talks about Jesus being the high priest of the order of Melchizedek. Okay, now in Israel... When God first called Israel, now, now, trivia question, this is kind of a trick question. When God called forth Israel, who did he call to be his priests? It's a trick question, but go ahead and put your answer out there. No, actually, when he called Israel, he said that all of you will be my priests. And then we have the separation of Levi and specifically Aaron as the priest, and then the Levites as the caretakers of the tabernacle and later the temple. But they were bought in exchange for the firstborn. Because when God, at the Passover, he slew the firstborn of all of Egypt, he declared for himself the firstborn of everything. Animal, human, the firstborn is God's. And when he established his people... He said, instead of taking the firstborn of each of you, I'm going to take for myself the entire tribe of Levi. And they will be mine as the firstborn. They're substitutionary. And, and you know what? God is so um, ordered that he adhered to his own law and required that the difference, they counted up all the people in Israel and said, this is the number of firstborn, and here's the number of the men of the tribe of Levi. <coughs> And there's not enough Levites for the firstborn. So God said, well, you've got to pay the fine. You've got to pay the difference. You've got to ransom back the difference of the firstborn. And thereby establishing the, the, the Levitical priesthood through the house of Aaron and the Levites who took care of all of the, the assisting of the priests. Okay? But originally, God had called all of them to be priests. Okay? So when he says we are a royal priesthood, <clears throat> First, we look at the priest. What was the function of the priest? Yeah, the intercessor. The one that bridged the gap. 
<coughs> excuse me, the one that the people came to and they presented their offerings, the priest took those offerings and presented them in an appropriate manner to God. Okay? And, and often, uh, as a matter of fact, when the priesthood was first set up, they were the judges. The people had a dispute. They brought it to the priesthood. Okay? And so the priests were the intercessors, not just between God and man, or God and man, but also between man and man. Okay? And he calls us a royal priesthood. But that first word there, that's, that's kind of a weird word to put in with priesthood. Because the priesthood was completely separate from royalty. Now when God brought the people into the land, he said, when you want for yourself a king, see God knew what was going to happen. And he laid out some, some things that needed to take place for the kings that would rule each, or Israel. Okay? And, and it wasn't too long till the people got fidgety. And they said, we want a king. And they went to Samuel, the prophet of God, and said, intercede on our behalf. Go to God and ask him. We want a king. And Samuel, I mean, you got to think, kind of broke his heart. Because God was their king. The Almighty God was their king. And they want a person of flesh and blood. So who did they get? They got exactly what they were looking for. They got someone tall and handsome <laughs> and strong and messed up. They got Saul. Okay? And so the, the, the king, the royalty, first came out of the tribe of Benjamin. And then Saul messed up. And he took upon himself a role that was not his to take. He offered sacrifice that he was not supposed to do. And I believe, honestly, I believe he did that with every good intention in his heart. He knew the sacrifice needed to be made to, to God before they it ventured out in their encounter with the Philistines. And, and the, the prophet wasn't there. He hadn't shown up yet to do his job. So he was doing what he thought to be right. Now, uh, this is a warning to us, okay, folks? If it doesn't line up with what God has told us, it doesn't matter how right it feels, it's wrong. Okay? And so God said, I am taking the kingdom away from Saul and away from his house. I'm going to give it to another. Now, this time, God did something a little different because he sent Samuel, and Samuel goes out, <clears throat> and he meets with Jesse. And he says, hey, let, let me see your sons. And so Jesse calls his sons in, and, you know, he looks at the first one, and Samuel's like, well, this has got to be it. I mean, he's a big, strapping man. You know, he's, he's comely of appearance. So surely this is what God wants to replace Saul. But isn't that exactly what they got with Saul? And God said, no, you're looking on the outside. I'm looking on the inside. This is not the one. So then he looks at the next brother. Oh, He's got to be it. I mean, if anything, he's even better than the last guy. And God says, no, you're still looking on the outside. I look on the inside. And so they go all the way down through the brothers. And, and, and Samuel, you've got to think by the end, Samuel's scratching his head. Well, you got any more? <laughs> well, we, we have one brother left, but he's, he's out in the field tending sheep. Well, go get him. And you've got to think, Samuel's like, oh, man, I must have misheard. <coughs> None of these guys are it. They all would have done fine by my estimation. Now they're bringing in the brat kid that shepherds the sheep. They don't even keep him in the house. <laughs> Trot him on up here. And so they bring David. And God says, this is the one. Because God was looking at the heart. Now, what's interesting here is we see a fulfillment of prophecy. Because when David became king, God spoke to him and said that you will always have a descendant on the throne as long as they keep my commands. Now, we see a lot of things happen throughout history. As a matter of fact, two generations later, we see the kingdom divided between Rehoboam and Jeroboam. And then we see a lot of mess happening down through the ages uh, to the point where kings were not even of David's line. But then, <coughs> after 400 years of silence, where God did not speak prophetically to any of the people. 
No word was brought forth as inspired of God. Now, there was a lot of stuff that was written, but none of it was inspired of God, okay? A child is born. A child who was of the line of David. And he was born in a meek and lowly place. And he fulfilled every part of the promise that God had given to David. This is the one that I'm going to raise up. But, but see, he, he came in a twofold position. Now, when he came the first time, he came as a lamb to be led to slaughter, which is, which is so cool because David was the shepherd. Jesus was the lamb. Okay? And when Jesus came, he was establishing himself not just as a king that would rule forever, but he's establishing himself as the high priest of the order of Melchizedek. Okay? Hebrews makes it very clear. He is not only our high priest, but he's our high sacrifice. The sacrifice that once for all took care of all sin. Okay? Now what's really cool about this is that being born of the tribe of Judah, what is the symbol for the tribe of Judah? What is the lion? The lion. And when he comes back, he's coming back as the lion of the tribe of Judah. And he's coming back in power and might to set correct all that is wrong. To take all the things that have been knocked out of kilter and line them up the way that they were intended to be. And he is going to come with authority, not just over Israel, but over all creation. He is coming back to claim for his own what is his. And we sang those songs that at the name of Jesus, every knee would bow and every tongue confess, Jesus Christ is Lord. Some of us are going to be doing that in worship and praise and adoration, adulation. Others are going to be doing it with clenched teeth and raised fists. They have to acknowledge who he is and they're going to hate it. Because they are going to have to come to that point where they realize they are not the Lord of their own life. That there is a master to whom they owe their allegiance and they will hate it. But they will confess. <coughs> they will bend their knee and they will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So a royal <coughs> priesthood, we see birthed in Christ the combining of these two offices. Okay? And we are inheritors of that. We are called the children of God. He is the high king. That makes us the princes and the princesses. And yet he has called us priests, the intercessors, the ones that go in between the people and God. That's a high task and a high calling that he has called us to. A holy nation. Now he's called us a chosen generation. As a matter of fact, it's really cool because when, when Jesus came, the word tells us that it was at the right time. That when the time was right, God sent his son. Okay? And he made a, a, a people that were not a people. But he calls us a holy nation. <coughs> completely set apart. And now think about that. In America, Christians are Americans, but even higher than that, we're Christians. And we are of the same nation as the Christians in Cuba, as the Christians in Zimbabwe, as the Christians in Malawi, as the Christians in Malaysia. We are of the same nation. God has made something new. A people for himself of all the people. And he has separated us out from the common and the profane and made us holy because Jesus took all the sin. And so now we have God's righteousness. Okay? We are a holy nation. Who is our allegiance to first? Wow, that was an absolutely pathetic <coughs> response. If you're not sure who your allegiance is to first, talk to me, please. Who is your allegiance to first? Uh, Thank you. First, God. First, God. Everything else so far down in second that it, it, it's uh, in an infinite gap. Okay? 
first God, before your political party, before your friends, before your children, before your spouse. Your allegiance is to God first. And if you get that right, all the other things will work out. As a matter of fact, they'll not just work out, they'll work out for the better. Because then you got God on your side pulling for you instead of working against you. Okay? So a holy nation, completely set apart. A people for his own possession. This is where in, in the King James it read a peculiar people. Okay? You are God's very own. You belong to him. Devil wants to come and mess with you? He's got to get permission first. World wants to attack you and drag you down? Got to ask God first. See, if this is not something to give you hope in this moment, in this life, then there is no hope for you. Because when you come to the cross, when you accept Him, not just as Savior, but as Lord, when you embrace that, this is you. This is you. You are a possession of the Almighty God, El Shaddai, the creator of the universe, the creator of all things, the Almighty God that by His very word, everything is held together. You're His. And He esteems you of greater value than anything else in all of creation. Because all of that's going to perish. And He's going to make new stuff for us. And He will make His dwelling with us. You think about that for a minute. This same God who is sitting in heaven right now who is measuring out the span of the universe with His hand who knows in intimate detail everything there is to know. He's going to dwell with us. It's not going to be at the mercy seat, separated by the veil, where only one person one time a year can go. That veil is torn aside. It's cast over. He's going to make His dwelling with us. And we will have no need of the sun or the moon because the light of His radiance will provide all the light that we need. Okay? You are a chosen race. God chose you. God chose you. A royal priesthood. You're a son of the king. You're a daughter of the king. And you're an intercessor. You're an intermediary between the people and God. Now that, that, that position puts us in a twofold responsibility. Not only do we come to God on behalf of the people, but we go to the people on behalf of God. Sometimes it's a brother or sister in Christ to encourage, maybe to exhort. But primarily our, our responsibility is to the people that don't know Him. He's called us to be not only His witnesses, but His ambassadors. Not only to testify what He's done for us, but to tell them about who He is. A holy nation, a far greater nation than America has ever been. A far greater nation than any nation has ever been. A people for His own possession. Why? That you may proclaim the excellencies of Him who called you. So let's break that down. That you can proclaim, speak forth, The excellencies, this is, this is all the good stuff about God, you are to speak it forth. <laughs> Who called you, that's that voice, that drawing voice. That, that, I love the story uh, that Gaylene shared a couple weeks ago when she called Christy and I. She was talking about this friend of hers, Ron, who came to the Lord. And he was just talking, you know, how, how he just 
He, he wanted to know. And he had this burden, and he didn't even realize how heavy the burden was until that moment when he gave it over to Jesus Christ. And he said it was just a weight lifted off of his shoulders. And he says, I'm crying. He said, I can't stop crying, but I'm not sad. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not sad. I love that. That's the redeeming work. That's the Holy Spirit coming and indwelling him. And, and setting things aright that were not askew by life, by sin, by corruption. Who has called you out of darkness into his just boring so-so light. <laughs> That's a marvelous light. When God reveals something to you, isn't it marvelous? Isn't it, you know, like when that little light bulb goes off in your head, bing! And all of a sudden you get something that you didn't get before? Isn't that marvelous? Mm -hmm. Once you were not a people. You know, before Christ, we probably didn't have very much in common. We had some things in common. But isn't Christ the greatest uniter? We can, we can you know, um, years ago... I put on a, a, um, a wild game dinner for the hunters. Which is really funny because I don't hunt. <laughs> I mean, my hunting goes, well, let's see, do I want this steak or do I want that steak? <laughs> okay. And, and I brought salad. And I hunted for the best head of lettuce. <laughs> and the best price. And, and croutons. And salad dressing. Because everybody else brought meat. Which is a good thing, but you know, women are going to be like, oh yeah, I'm yeah, yeah, eating all meat, you know, just men. Meat and beans, meat and beans, meat and beans, hockey, okay. <laughs> but I brought a salad. <laughs> Not a lot in common with all those hunters, huh? Man, there was moose, there was elk, there was a bunch of different kinds of venison. There were some wild game birds. I don't even, I didn't even get a taste of all of it. There was so much different meat there. And salad. <laughs> but you know what brought us together? Jesus Christ. And before we ate, we were able to gather together in unity and pray to the same God. We asked blessing in the name of the same Savior. We fellowshiped with the same Spirit. Okay? You are not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. What is mercy? Holding back what we deserve. What's that? Holding back what we deserve. Holding back what we deserve. See, grace is you get something you didn't deserve. Mercy is you didn't get something you did deserve. God extends both grace and mercy. Because, see, His grace is that... <clears throat> We are considered righteous. His mercy is that we're no longer punished for our sin. We didn't receive mercy before, but when we come to the cross, we receive mercy. And this is what binds us all together. Look, your sin may look very different from mine. Before we came to Christ, your, your place in life probably looked very different from mine. But it was that same grace and that same mercy that brings us together and binds us into the body of Christ. Okay, one body. Ephesians chapter 4, first about seven verses. Take a look at it this week. One, 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 one. Okay? Ephesians chapter 4, first about six, seven verses. I want you to read that. Okay? Now, my, my whole goal in this series is I want us to really grasp and hold on to what we are when we are in Christ. Because the number one trick of the enemy, he's called the deceiver for a reason. Okay? The deceiver. He wants us to feel less than we are. He wants us to feel like we don't deserve these things. He's right. We don't deserve them. That's the marvelous thing about grace. Is he gave it to us anyway. That's what's so incredible about it. But then, he wants to keep us bound up. Oh, you know, God's not going to forgive you for that. 
You're a lousy person. Thank God I'm a lousy person because if I was a good person, why would I need God? I wouldn't. Neither would you. So you're a lousy person together. We're lousy people together. But we have His grace and His mercy. Amen. And we have His Spirit living inside of us, growing us, teaching us, molding us, making us into people that reflect Him. So my, my goal in this life is to be a mirror for God so that when people look at me, they see God. I, I hope they don't ever see me. I got issues. <laughs> you see all these bumps on my head? Don't look at me. Look at God. Amen? Amen. Father, we bless you. I thank you, God, that you have made us a new creation. Something unique. Out of everything that you've made, you have made us your very own. You have made of us individual children. You have taken those children and you have blended them together to become the body. You have brought us from all different backgrounds, from different races, from different peoples, from different life. And you have made us your very own. You have made us a people where we were not a people before. And then you have marked us and called us your own. And for God, that God we just, <coughs> we want to express our thanks. Teach us, Father, to honor you in all that we do. Teach us, Father, right thinking that we would be able to hold a proper estimate of ourselves. Not because of who we are, but because of who you are and who you say we are. Help us, Father, to quickly identify the lies of the enemy and to replace them with your truth. What you have said is truth. Even when everything around us points to one conclusion, if your word tells us different, that's truth. We honor you today, God, and bless you because you are so faithful, you are so loving, and you are so kind. In Jesus' name, amen.